Welcome to another session of Grand Rounds in Urology. Uh, I, my name is Lenore Ackerman, and I am here today with two uh, amazing urologists to talk about their recent study about patient perceptions in urinary tract infections. So with me today are Dr. Victoria Scott, who is a faculty at Cedars-Sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles, and Dr. Jahan Kim, who is a faculty at the University of California in Los Angeles as well. Um, Today, they're here to talk about this new study that they have recently published called Fear and Frustration Among Women with Recurrent ETIs. And I will hand over the mic to Dr. Scott to give us a little bit of an orientation to some of their key findings. All right. Thank you, Lenny. Thanks so much for having us. Um, so we titled our study Fear and Frustration Among Women with Recurrent ETIs. Um, and that, that basically describes our main finding. Um, we really, um, as Dr. Kim and I were just talking about, were inspired to do this study by all the women we were seeing in clinic who were very bothered by UTIs um, and, and care. So we recruited 29 women um, from a tertiary care academic setting to participate in one of six focus groups, um, really with the goal of, of elucidating and evaluating their perspectives on their current care, um, and what they'd like to see for the future and, and how we can improve the quality of the care we provide. We performed the focus group discussions. Um, we, we recorded them and had them transcribed and then used grounded theory methodology to analyze the transcripts. And this is a common methodology used for qualitative studies, um, which allows you to approach the data in a, in a scientific way to really kind of um, gain a good idea of, of what your, your focus group discussions are saying. So um, we had independent coders um, analyze each transcript, um, identifying first keywords, and then looking at those all together to develop subcategories and from those preliminary themes and emerging concepts. And then um, all of those were compared across the different coders. So to briefly review initial preliminary themes, um, first, fear of development of antibiotic resistance. So many of our participants had um, good knowledge of uh, the concept of development of antibiotic resistance in individuals as well as on a population level. And they were very fearful of this um, because it had either happened to them um, or they were very fearful that they would start to develop infections with very resistant antibiotics. Um, they also demonstrated knowledge of collateral damage from antibiotics, so um, disruption of the natural flora or microbiome um, in the genitourinary tract. Um, they were very aware of the consequences of this and predisposing to future infections as well. They talked about concern about taking unnecessary antibiotics, so calling their doctors with, with symptoms and simply just being given antibiotics without having their urine tested, ensuring that they're on proper antibiotics and if they even need antibiotics. They demonstrated anger at physicians, um, as I kind of mentioned for what they described as just throwing antibiotics at them. They felt like they weren't being heard and physicians were just trying to um, kind of alleviate them by giving them what they thought that the patients wanted. Um, patients also discussed feeling that the medical profession underestimates the impact of their condition. Um, so they felt that oftentimes their lives had um, significant detrimental um, effects from all their infections um, that weren't really being recognized by their providers, social as well as economic. Um, and they also discussed a need for research on non-antibiotic options for prevention and treatment. They felt like these weren't discussed with them. And then when they did their own research, they really weren't able to find good non-antibiotic options. And finally, um, we identified amongst the groups resentment for not dedicating more research levels. Um, and this was kind of with the medical profession and society as a whole um, to help develop more tools to provide more timely diagnosis. So they were all pretty familiar with delays in um, when their urine was tested, obtaining urine culture data. And then when we looked at all these preliminary themes, really we identified these two emergent concepts of fear and frustration. Um, so as I mentioned, fear of developing antibiotic resistance, of collateral damage from antibiotics and receiving unnecessary antibiotics and frustration really with 
um, the medical profession with physicians not validating their experiences and fears, um, resentment over not being offered any non-antibiotic options for prevention and treatment, as well as um, with the entire medical system for not dedicating more research to um, developing more diagnostic tools, um, as well as non-antibiotic options. So that was basically what we found. Um, and we, I think we were expecting to find this, um, as I mentioned, based on, you know, the patients that we're seeing in clinic. Um, but I think it was even more pronounced than we even had expected, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, thank you, Victoria. That was a beautiful summary. Um, and, you know, we now, this particular study has now spawned two additional um, sort of qualitative study. We were then naturally interested in what the physicians were thinking about the current management of patients with recurrent UTIs. And so we interviewed some experts and that uh, finding will be soon available uh, in a manuscript form. We're also uh, in the process of interviewing um, primary care physicians as well to un understand their knowledge, their uh, comfort in referring or treating patients with recurrent UTIs. But the what we learned from the study is that the patients are not happy with how physicians are managing their recurrent UTIs. Urinary tract infection is seemingly a very simple, um, I, I don't want to say simple, but very straightforward problem to solve. You have a culture, it's positive, you get an antibox, end of story. But what happens is um, we don't have an understanding of why they have recurrence or whether or not these recurrent symptoms are due to UTIs at all. So, you know, there are multiple um, uh, areas, areas to address. Number one, thinking about non-antibiotic alternative ways to manage them, and also understanding whether or not um, their symptoms are due to infection at all. Um, but yeah, this is, uh, we really wanted to get the patient's perspective because we were seeing so many patients that were unhappy and, you know, it was important to um, kind of capture that in a, in a very open setting to, to address it. I think one of the things that stands out to me about the study is not as much the frustration, because I think anyone who takes care of patients with UTIs is very cognizant that often patients, particularly those with recurrent infections that have not been you know, addressed, um, there's a huge amount of this palpable frustration. But I think in general, we tend to interpret that frustration as, why aren't you giving me medications? Why aren't you giving me more antibiotics? And I think that, you know, this is really the first data that I've seen that really captures that, that concept that patients really are not seeking antibiotics the way that I think a lot of us think that they are. Dr. Scott, let me ask you a quick question. Um, is there any sort of data that came out of this or from other studies that that seems to suggest that patients would be open to avoiding antibiotics or other ways that they're interested in managing these things. Obviously non-antibiotic options uh, uh, would be great, but uh, for what we have currently, has, was there any sort of expression on the patient side of things they were interested in pursuing to manage their symptoms? Yes, absolutely. Um, when we did look back, you know, at, at the literature, um, we certainly found smaller studies, but but definitely some studies out there which which were able to demonstrate the patient perspective of even up to sixty percent of patients demonstrating willingness um, to delay antibiotic therapy once they had the education and kind of understanding that um, they could clear an, even a, a true infection with bacteria without antibiotics um, and a better understanding of what the threshold would be to call to get antibiotics or go to the emergency room. Um, so our, our study definitely confirmed those findings. Um, and then in terms of management data um, supporting that management strategy and the safety of it, um, there have certainly been studies looking at particularly NSAIDs for symptomatic relief versus antibiotic therapy and showing that even up to 40, 50% or higher um, of bacteria episodes can be cleared without antibiotics, um, which I think is a concept that a lot of patients would be really excited to hear about and, and um, would be useful in their care as well. Obviously with making sure they have understandings that progression to pylo is possible. Um, however, many of the studies did not show significant um, uh, increased risk without antibiotics. So um, those are definitely important points. 
So it sounds like in addition to trying to do a better job of hearing patients' uh, frustrations and and education, um, but it, it sounds like even that intervention of education by itself may be as useful or valid uh, a, a therapy for 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 patients with recurrent UTIs as, as throwing antibiotics, as you mentioned earlier. Um, lastly, I just wanted to kind of get some feedback from you guys on um, something else that came up in a, in a more, uh, in a earlier podcast, we were discussing with Dr. Nickel recent findings uh, from his research group uh, regarding a vaccine for recurrent UTIs. And obviously something like this would be a great uh, benefit to patients who are suffering uh, from these from these infections. But one thing that he mentioned was that one, um, one potential reason why a vaccine for UTIs may work is because you're allowing the body to actually develop that natural resistance by allowing it to fight off these these bacteria. And he even went so far as to kind of suggest that that part of one one potential reason why we continue to have this sort of epidemic of recurrent UTIs in women is that we do throw antibiotics at them and that there isn't uh, the ability for the body to sort of face those infections and develop resistant, uh, develop immunity to them. Did you get any sense from patients about, you know, their, their willingness to consider consider that kind of clearance on their own or, or um, maybe uh, a, a, a willingness to, to allow that natural immunity to develop or, or would this be something else that, that could be explored in future studies or in, in concert with patients in the future? I think that's a really great point. Um, one thing I do want to add was the one limitation of this study was that the women were primarily, uh, the median age was 41. There were majority of them were college uh, educated and they were also Caucasian. And mm-hmm. so we had a very sort of like a, a, a skewed population. But very health think, literate kind of. Right, right. And so I think they, and also they've been through so many different doctors. That's one thing we probably should have looked at how many other providers they saw before they came to a tertiary referral center. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there's really, uh, like I said, just really huge number of areas that we need to look at. But I think that may be the nat- natural next step because we're going to really, ch- you know, you know, change the needle and change the perspective and change the paradigm shift in how we manage them. We mm-hmm. need to start getting these answers. And because we can't do a clinical trial just yet, but maybe a qualitative study, a focus group study asking women about their willingness to really, you know, try something new. Um, you know, the, the uh, acute UTI is certainly an urgent issue to treat, but it's, it's not, doesn't have a lot of morbidity as some of the other issues. So um, I think that trying something novel is certainly not uh, a bad idea. Well, and it sounds a little bit from, from what you were saying that that a focus on on managing their experience, not necessarily on what we tend to focus on, which is bacterial clearance, which really isn't the important part here. The the symptoms, the discomfort, and the and the the as you as you mentioned, Dr. Scott, the the sort of way that it disrupts their entire life. Like those are the things we folk we should maybe focus on moving forward rather than than the clearance of bacteria and that that kind of focus, like you were saying, uh, Dr. Kim, may be maybe the way to sort of the shift shift the needle in the care of these patients. Um, I want to thank you both for joining us today. This was a really, really uh, a great experience for me to hear more about this study and more about uh, some of the surprising findings that you had. And we, we very much uh, are grateful that you could share it with us today. Thank you again.